So what are flashbacks? Why might someone experience them after an abusive relationship? And how can you cope with them? My name's Ruth Ann. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm an expert in relationships and issues of narcissism. In this video, I'm going to help you understand why you might have flashbacks, how you can cope with them, and what kind of mental health care would likely be helpful to you if you're experiencing flashbacks. Flashbacks are a key symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. PTSD is something that can develop after a person is exposed to a life-threatening situation or a situation where they're threatened with serious physical injury or sexual assault or violence, or they witness that happening to someone else. And of course, people who've been through relational abuse will often have been through these kinds of situations and that can result in post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. PTSD is something that often happens after just one single traumatic event. Survivors of um, domestic violence or any kind of relational abuse have often been through multiple traumatic events, are often going through traumatic events on an almost daily basis over a long period of time. And that can really compound the trauma and its effect on how someone sees themselves, how they experience their relationships, how they manage and cope with difficult emotions. Um, it really can have a profound effect. And there is a bit of a debate within the literature, within the field about um, the differences between PTSD and whether or not there is a separate category of complex PTSD. When I work with people who've been through abusive relationships, I usually think of it as a more complex PTSD presentation. And I tend to expect that the therapy and the support is likely to be much broader than just focusing on the PTSD symptoms. I'm likely to really have to help this person work on their sense of themselves, their ability to regulate their emotions, their ability to be um, compassionate towards themselves, their ability to relate to others. All of those things are really, really really important. But in this video, I'm just going to focus on flashbacks. So most of the time when we go about our day, our brain is taking on new information all the time and it files away our memories in a memory store. Now, one part of the brain that's involved in this is called the hippocampus. And you can kind of think of the hippocampus as being a bit like a filing cabinet for memories. When information comes in, it gets put into a file, it gets date and time stamped and it gets filed away. And we have some degree of control over when we recall memories. And when we recall them, we know that the memory, whether it's something that was a very happy experience or a more difficult or painful experience, we know it happened in the past and it's not happening now. So when we recall something that's happened in the past, whether it's a happy memory or a more painful memory, the emotion that we experience when we recall it is not likely to be as strong as it was at the time. So imagine that you're going about your day, you're making decisions, you're analyzing information, you're weighing things up. The part of your brain that's thinking about things is online and active. And suddenly you see a giant tiger coming at you. Now, this is not a time to analyze your options. This is not a time to think things through carefully. In order to survive, you have to act and you have to act fast. So what happens in our brain? Well, our survival instincts kick in. Another part of our brain called the amygdala, which is our fear and threat center, becomes very, very active. It's firing on all cylinders and our body fills up with adrenaline and we're either going to get ready to, to flee the situation, to flight, um, or we're going to get ready to fight, or maybe we're going to freeze. We're just going to pass out. Now, all of those strategies increase your chance of surviving a major threat. But the part of your brain that normally processes information, puts it into a folder, gives it a date and timestamp, it's offline. So those trauma memories may not end up in storage in the hippocampus. So what happens is that our memories begin to kind of run riot. They're kind of, they're not date and time stamped. They're activated by even the smallest triggers, little things that might remind you of that traumatic event. Maybe it's a smell or a color or a particular sound or a taste. 
anything at all. And it can be very, very subtle that reminds you of that traumatic event. And before you know it, that memory is activated and it feels present. It has a quality of happening here and now, not of being in the past. And so you can begin to experience very, very strong emotions that you experienced at the time of the traumatic event. You can also start to experience physical sensations. And for some people, they can even start to act like the event is happening again. For survivors of abuse, the source of their trauma is often someone they trusted, someone who treated them at times with kindness, someone who has physically touch them and interacted with them, someone who's been in their home environment, engaging in the day-to-day activities. So I'm sure you can imagine that for someone who survived relational abuse, their trauma triggers are everywhere. There's many, many ways that those memories can be triggered. And this can be really overwhelming Because relational trauma tends to occur over time, and particularly if it's occurred in childhood, it can result in those parts of the brain that are really reactive to threat being kind of a bit overdeveloped, and the parts of the brain that are better at thinking and processing and putting memories into context being a bit underdeveloped. Now, that's not to suggest that you're brain damaged if you've been through this, but I do think it's really helpful for you to have an understanding that this isn't your fault, that there's really strong um, psychological and biological reasons why flashbacks happen and why they can be so overwhelming and challenging to deal with. Now, here are some strategies that people I've worked with have found helpful in managing flashbacks. And they're also strategies that I've implemented myself in a time in my life when I was experiencing flashbacks. So the first thing is to really tell yourself and to have a kind of internal dialogue, which says, I am having a flashback. That's what's happening right now. And this is really about you kind of almost bringing your thinking brain back online and being able to talk to your amygdala, talk to that part of you that's really anxious and scared and overwhelmed to say, that was the past, that was then, this is now, and you're having a flashback and you are safe. And some things you can do to help yourself with that is you could even record yourself or record a a little video of yourself telling yourself what you need to hear when you're having a flashback that was then, this is now, you're having a flashback, you're not actually in danger, it's okay. Or if it helps, you could ask a friend, a family member, or even your therapist to record something like that for you that you can play when you're having a flashback. Some other things that can help you is to have reminders in your environment of things that have happened since the traumatic event or events. So that could be photographs of friends or family and things that you've done after the traumatic event. Now, the idea of that is that you've got objects in your environment that can begin to just say, hey, this is now. Things have moved on. Things have changed. You're no longer in that threatening situation. So if you have photographs of friends, of family, of places that you've been to that were pleasant places. Now, clearly, if if they're photographs of friends or family, they've got to be photographs of friends and family who you have positive, supportive, caring relationships with, not photographs of someone who's hurt you, but photographs of people who you feel safe with, who you've spent time with and recent photographs photographs of things that have happened recently. And if you take a little trip anywhere or you go somewhere new, you know, get a little keepsake of that trip and have it somewhere um, where you might be experiencing flashbacks because then you can look at it and remind yourself, hey, this is now, this is now, this is my life now. If you're living in the same home where the abuse has happened, something really simple that you can do is to rearrange the furniture, rearrange your environment, put some new things in. Again, this is just about giving your brain a chance to update itself so it knows, hey, I'm in the present. I'm now. I'm not in the past when the abuse was happening. It's really about creating an environment that showcases all of the things that are happening in your life now that are not threatening to you. 
flashbacks can happen in any of the senses. They can be visual, they can be auditory, they can be, they can be a smell, they can be a taste, they can be a tactile sensation. So you can also do something that generates a different sensation to the flashback. So if you smell something when you're having a flashback, you can have things to smell. You can have um, like aromatherapy, oils, um, something that smells pleasant to you. Um, Some therapists will actually encourage people to create a safe place image that they smell something while they're imagining their safe place and then they can almost use the sense of smell as they a, a trigger to bring them to a safe place um it's worth a try you could if you have a lot of auditory flashbacks you could have pieces of music that you play that again remind you of the here and now and don't remind you of the trauma if you have kind of taste flashbacks you could have things that you um would taste like you would suck um that would give you a different sensation. I've worked with people who've used like very strong menthol sweets to give them a different sensation in their mouth. Again, that might be worth a try if you have strong taste sensations when you're having a flashback. Um, If you have strong tactile sensations, you can practice maybe having an object that you hold, you could rub your arms, you could um, hold your hand, you could stroke yourself in a soothing way, whatever makes sense for you um, and gives you something different to, to the flashback. And again, the whole idea of this is about bringing your mind, your body, your brain into the here and now and really giving yourself the reassurance that was then and this is now. Some flashbacks can take the form of nightmares and I've known people to even avoid sleep because they're terrified of having a nightmare. That does tend to make things worse because as you get more sleep deprived, you're more likely to have perceptual disturbances, which means you're actually more likely to have a flashback. So really do try your best to get some good sleep and you can create a a sleep environment that's very here and now. Have photographs, beside your bed of recent events or objects um, that remind you of recent events or places that you've been, things that you've done recently. And of course, make your bedroom as soothing and as pleasant and as nice a place to be as you possibly can. Finally, um, but perhaps the most important, I think, is having some self-soothing activities and a lot of compassion for yourself. Please don't beat yourself up or berate yourself for having flashbacks or feel hopeless and despairing of yourself. This is a real moment of suffering. It's really painful. Your poor brain is confused about what's past and present and really deserves to be treated with kindness and gentleness and respect. I think it's really key for survivors of abuse because so often when they've experienced very painful and difficult emotions, which you do in a flashback, you've also experienced abusive words, criticism, and belittling from the person who abused you. So it's really easy for survivors of abuse when they have a flashback to go to a very self-critical place and really beat themselves up. So it's so important to develop a sense of self-compassion and a kind and soothing voice that gives you the kindness and the respect and the gentleness that you deserve when you're experiencing flashback. While these are all really helpful coping strategies with flashbacks, in the long term, it's probably going to be very helpful for you to get some psychological therapy that helps you with the PTSD. There are a number of really, really good options for therapies that might be able to help you to process those difficult memories and kind of put them into that long-term storage so that when you do remember them, yes, they're painful, yes, they're difficult memories, but they don't have that same quality of nowness. So if you are experiencing flashbacks, please do, if you possibly can, see a mental health care professional who has experience in assessing and supporting people with PTSD so they can give you some individualized guidance and recommendations for appropriate treatments. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have, please hit the like button and also leave a comment and share your thoughts with me. If you'd like to hear more from me in the future, hit the subscribe button. I look forward to seeing you next time. In the meantime, take good care.